Okay. Okay, thanks for joining everybody. Um, so I'll just make a start on the introduction and then uh, we can get started on the webinar itself. Uh, so welcome everyone to our latest uh, Welfare for Wildlife webinar. On behalf of Wild Welfare and Global Animal Welfare, we're very excited to see you all today. Um, and it should be a really interesting session. So today we are joined by Dr. Jenny Gray and Dr. Uh, Dr. Sally Sherwin, both of Zoos Victoria, um, and that is the conservation organisation charged with the operation of Melbourne Zoo, Eelsville Sanctuary and uh, Werribee Open Range Zoo in Australia. Uh, so Dr. Jenny Gray is the Chief Executive Officer of Zoos Victoria and has a wide range of public and private sector experience, including qualifications in civil engineering, transportation engineering, business administration and ethics. She brings a passion for animals and the environment, having facilitated the transformation of Zoos Victoria into a zoo-based conservation organisation. In 2016, Jenny completed her PhD in ethics and her thesis on an ethical defence of modern zoos. Her thesis has been published by CSIRO and is a commercially available book titled Zoo Ethics. Jenny serves on a number of governing bodies. She's the past president of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, is a council appointed member of the Victoria University Council and the president and chair of Not In My Workplace, a small association committed to addressing sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, and Dr. Sally Sherwin is the Director of Wildlife Conservation and Science at Zoos Victoria. Sally leads a dynamic team of scientists and specialists that develop and deliver strategic programs in conservation, animal welfare, education and environmental sustainability. Sally has a PhD in animal welfare science and in previous roles has established an evidence-based research program in animal behavior and welfare science, developed and implemented an institutional welfare assessment tool to advance welfare standards and designed and ran collaborative training courses with several NGOs for industry professionals and community groups. So before we get started, just a reminder for our audience that at the end of the session, there should be time for questions. So if you do have any, please do drop them into the Q&A. Uh, Jelly, Jenny and Sally, thank you both very much for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah, and it's really great to join you today. Um, I'm going to share the screen and, and start pulling up our little presentation. And we're both really excited to be presenting today and talking to you about the real holistic wildlife welfare journey that we've been on as Zoos Victoria. Um, and to start with, I'd like to pay respect to the elders of the land on which we're gathering, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We recognize their deep connection to country and acknowledge sovereignty that was never ceded on the land on which we gathered. This continent always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And we thank the traditional owners for protecting these ecosystems over decades and, and thousands of years. The journey for us as Zoos Victoria probably has been going on for a very long time. But in 2009, we had a really pivotal moment where we went out to try and save this little bat, the Christmas Island Pipistrel. And we literally arrived too late. We arrived in time to record an extinction event. And that has changed very much the trajectory of the journey that we've been on for the last decade and a bit. From that point, we took a commitment that no Victorian terrestrial vertebrate species would go extinct on our watch. And that meant we really needed to work with our community. And so we implemented community conservation campaigns. We also took the step of saying we wouldn't contribute to climate change. And so we've been a carbon neutral organization. Since starting in 2009, we've achieved certification in 2012. Our journey continued into the development of our first wildlife conservation master plan. That master plan, so us really working with 21 critically endangered species, as well as working internationally on programs that directly impacted on the survival of species. We made a commitment in 2014 that the Eastern Barred Bandicoot that was current at that point listed as extinct in the wild here in Victoria, only living within captive areas, um, that we would fully recover that species. And that led us to revising our wildlife conservation master plan we have increased from, unfortunately, 21 species to 27. We also decided to really go out there and share our messaging more widely. And so hence, we got into a TV show called Megazoo, 
we've been out in that. And all of this was tracking really well. And then 2020 hit. And with 2020, the bushfire emergency that hit the eastern sea, sorry, yeah, the eastern seaboard of Australia made us pause and rethink. It made us realize that climate change not only is it real, but the impacts on both animals and humans in terms of natural well-being is absolutely incredible. And that has shaped where we're thinking about our future. And while we were busy working on bushfire recovery, we also remember the little bandicoot managed to have it relisted. And so it has been delisted, moving from extinct in the wild back to endangered. So an incredible journey, but one that's not even vaguely over yet. We often get asked what a zoo does in the 21st century. In fact, we think the word zoo doesn't fully explain what we're doing. So let's share with you what that is. We run breeding and recovery programs for many local species in the brink of extinction. We treat injured wildlife in our wildlife hospitals and send vets to run the triage centres in bushfire zones. We're ready to respond to any marine animal needing our help. We teach millions of visitors to care for the natural world and make wildlife friendly choices. Perhaps zoo isn't the right word at all. Because we're actually a wildlife conservation organisation. And for some species, we are their last hope. We won't let Victoria's wildlife go extinct on our watch. I'm hoping you got a little excited thinking about us as a conservation organization, but I'm going to take you back a step. Because while we can talk about saving animals in the wild, we actually have a huge obligation to the animals in our care. And on this, we believe at Zoos Victoria that animal welfare is not something that we should do. It's something we have to live and breathe. It's not an obligation, it's in our DNA. And that means what we do is we assess regularly and consistently the animal welfare of every single animal that lives with us at Zoos Victoria. We are proactive in our strategy of thinking always what can help them thrive and trying to show some leadership and work with others in working on things that may or may not work to the detriment of animals in our care. All our staff have a role to play in this and we want them to be very invested in it and we can be advocates beyond our walls. And so we've put these three big ideas together, the fighting extinction that I, we shared through the video, the management of animals in our care, making sure that they experience the best possible life, and emergency wildlife, wildlife response based on what we learned through the bushfires. And adding to that is the need for us to be a voice for wildlife, speaking up when things are important to wildlife and wildlife survival. So all of these work together in what we call working for wildlife. And I'm going to hand over to Sally to share with you how we're doing that slightly differently now, based on what we learned from the Black Summer. Thank you, Jenny. And lovely to be here with you guys, as well as part of this webinar and share some of our insights and learnings over the last um, couple of years. So I'm going to talk um, very briefly about some of what happened during and in the aftermath of the Black Summer fires here in Australia, the summer of 2019 and 2020. And it can really be categorised by this, um, this combination of both heartbreak and hope of, of what came out of it. Um, this koala you can see pictured here is Leafy and he's got um, a just fascinating story uh, that we'll share with you throughout this. Um, next slide, thanks Jenny. 
So when we start to talk about uh, this, this period, it's important for us to just take a moment and reflect, uh, acknowledge the human loss that, um, that happened in the period, acknowledge the wildlife loss as well that was on an, an absolutely catastrophic scale, and also pay respect to those who fought and those who helped throughout this, this period. And Zoos Victoria, along with a range of other organisations and individuals made a vow to, to learn from this and um, put, put what was a, an, a tragedy into a, a positive lens to try and do better in the future. So we refer to it as a moment of change in society. It was really a moment here um, that we often talk about in the aftermath as the moment you could feel society here locally changing. We, climate change became real. People in the big cities um, really, you know, you could smell the smoke, you could see it. it, it impacted directly daily lives. And so this is now um, turned to a big political discussion as well as we're actually coming up to a, a federal election in the, in the coming weeks as well. And never before have we seen so much discussion about the environment. It doesn't mean that it's going to end particularly well or be overly ambitious in what happens here, but it's um, where we're taking the, the discussion and how much of a priority this topic is as a, as a positive out of it. So we're gonna focus on what we did as Zoos Victoria to, to move through this period. Um, this was the extent of the fires. This figure shows how, how much of Australia was really on fire during this period over a series of months. Um, we're just on that map here. For those of you who aren't familiar with where we are, you can see Jenny's using the mouse there in that bottom right corner. That's Victoria. That's um, where we're based and where our work happens. So along that east coast was particularly bad hit and we lost a lot of um, wildlife in particular hotspots down that eastern seaboard. And if we keep moving through the images, Jenny, the, um, a lot of the graphics and the images were really highlighting that the human loss and tragedy, but also the wildlife toll that these fires took because of where the, the actual fires were burning. And koalas were certainly the poster child of what happened here with um, pretty devastating images of the, the impact on this species. And if we just keep flicking through, there's an image of the um, where the koalas, the koalas range is along the eastern coast of Australia. So you can see here that's where both the northern species and the, the southern subspecies exist. And then the next figure shows um, really that that path of the fires and where that was particularly severely burnt along that east coast there. And so it's no wonder they were the, uh, the poster child of what was happening here because they were particularly hard hit, particularly further up north, but um, it had a huge impact on, on those populations. And um, it's a big focus of conservation action um, further up north in New South Wales. This image here shows, or this, this figure shows the state of Victoria where we work. And on the right there, you can see the shaded areas is what um, the, the severity of the change in biodiversity value. So all this is highlighting is that that part where there was significant fires burn in the, in the east coast, the northeast of Victoria, was also where there was significant biodiversity hotspots. And so the toll it took on the environment and a lot of biodiversity values here was significant. So this really was our time to put, put into practice all of the skills that we as, as an organization that works for wildlife have. So we focused our response in three main areas. Um, according to our expertise as a zoo-based conservation organisation, we went, right, what can we do? What can we rally together to support the community and the environment through this? And so these three areas were wildlife, health and welfare. Um, so having our vets on the front lines, supporting the, the triage units and in the recovery and rehab efforts afterwards, threatened species recovery. So we do a lot of um, hands-on interventions in threatened species work for the state. So um, in partnership with a, with a heap of other organisations as well. So putting our skills to the test in um, these really highly impacted species and establishing new conservation breeding programs. 
And then also focusing in on the community and what we could do with our social science skills and the, the platform we have through visitors that come, come through our gates every day. So how do we rally that community support and get, get people behind the plight of this recovery phase that we're in? Next slide, thanks, Jenny. So just a few images, and Jenny, I think it's fine to just flick through this. This is, um, these are just a few images of what it looked like on the ground. So with the vets working to support, these are koalas being evacuated from Malakuta, one of the, um, the hardest hit locations, and our vets there and vet nurses and, and volunteers to help airlift them out in partnership with the Air Force, which was, um, which was a great partnership and setting up mobile triage zones and sites so that the koalas got the best care that they could. What we did then with these koalas is supported them through intensive care and recovery and used it as a learning opportunity to set up research programs to understand their recovery through this, this period and how their, their wounds healed and also what, what it meant for the under the surface type issues as well. And so they were put through a range of different medical treatments and eventually released back to the wild. So here's some images of them going back and then we followed them radio tracking to see how they were recovering and their welfare post-release to, to learn what we could about the different effectiveness of different treatments and time in rehabilitation and what that would mean for their survival. So this is where we're at pre-bushfire in this area of wildlife welfare. So um, there are wildlife hospitals in the state there. Um, and we had quite limited coordination and reach across the state. But this next slide shows us now where we're at and what the part of the plan and the strategy is through these partnerships. So a really connected network of dedicated people, um, vets and, and carers working for wildlife in this system. And this is a short video talking about one of our key threatened species that we've established a program with. The spotted tree frog, it wasn't only the fire that, that's burnt the bush leading into the streams, but then the post-fire rain that followed and the flooding washes the ash and the sediment and silt down into the rivers, um, which chokes them out. And it also prevents decent breeding from happening because the, the tadpoles and eggs aren't able to survive in those sort of conditions. Short-term goals is to uh, just get the population going. We've managed to collect a small number of frogs uh, this season and then over the coming few years we'll add to that. So it'll be to rear the frogs through to breeding age and those adults that we have collected uh, will begin to start breeding them next season. It's incredible to have these animals come in to start as new founders that will establish conservation breeding program. Importantly with this project now though, we've had the support and partnership with the Victorian angling community as well. So they've been on board to help us uh, along this journey and also help us find safe havens that we'll hopefully be able to release these frogs back into. So as Sal says, we really had this moment where we were looking at the impacts of climate change, the, the extremity of these events, 
And when we look at what's happening with our endangered species, and I'm sure I don't need to tell all of you this, they're really in a lot of trouble. But the one thing that links all of the threats is us, it's humans, and it's our extreme human population growth that's really worrying us. And so we've been working with people, and I wanted to share a little story with you. This is Danny. She's six. She said she was seven because she's still young enough to lie about her age, but lie up where the rest of us lie down. And she was deeply, deeply shy, a, a really anxious child. And she had a wonderful mother who taught her that she could stop being a warrior, being worried about everything, and become a wildlife warrior. And about the time of the bushfires, Danny worked out, she said, if I can help, I can help those who are smaller and more scared than I am. And so this adorable little girl stood up at the school assembly. She started collecting money. She went to see CEOs of large organizations and asked them to help her. And she dedicated her efforts to helping to save the little mountain pygmy possums that live up above the snow line and were really impacted through the burns in Mount Kosciuszko. This little girl on her own raised one and a half thousand dollars to help endangered species. And if it was just about Danny, well, we'd be kind of worried about that, but it's not. We were inundated by people who wanted to help. And that was from little children bringing in their pocket money to pensioners bringing in their pensions. They all wanted to donate money. And some of them wanted to do more than donate money. They wanted to work for wildlife. The first kid here baked cookies and sold them at his local store. These two boys did a car wash in their neighborhood and charged the neighbors to wash their cars and brought the money in to donate. And these wonderful ladies held a sausage sizzle at their old age home and brought the money into Healesville Sanctuary. What all of these people wanted to do was wanted to be involved. And I think when we see wildlife in trouble, it's a strange person who doesn't want to be able to contribute and help. In all, over 30,000 people reached out to help us. And people came to help us from around the world. The vet that you see there is not our vet, even though he's wearing a Zoo's Victoria top. He's from Taronga Zoo and came down and worked with our vets to help the koalas in trouble. Our staff were invited to the Australian Open where they interacted with international tennis stars and visitors, sharing the stories of hope and collecting donations. And our colleagues from the Prague Zoo raised an enormous amount of money, which they have dedicated towards helping the species impacted through the bushfires. We literally saw people around the world stepping up and wanting to be involved. And we've carried on with that because we realized that people really definitely want to help wildlife. And so each year now we're running a program called Summer with Wildlife, where we help people and not only share with them what they can do, but demonstrate it on site in our properties. And it's like the wildlife got the message. So when we put a bird bath out, you get a whole lot of birds all in sharing that bird bath, but you get visitors seeing that and understanding what they can do to help make life a little bit better and easier for wildlife on these really hot days. And we do this because not only is it the right thing to do, but people really notice. And so what we do is we track public sentiment of our zoos. And what we can show is that doing this is good for business as well as being good for the environment. And when we're really active, we get huge positive ratings from the public around the work we're doing. And they see us as an organization that is walking the talk, that we're not just greenwashing, we're actually really committed to what we say we're doing. And so moving forward, Sal, do you want to share what we're thinking about next? Yeah, so this, uh, what, what this all taught us is the, I think the really real value in us focusing on a, a transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach that merges different focus areas for us. So overall, we're calling this a, a holistic approach to conservation. So blending the boundaries between threatened species biology, animal welfare and veterinary science and social science and looking for that sweet spot where they all work together in a mutually beneficial way. And I think we've just got this, this graphic that we've been playing around with a little bit that where we see gains for the environment, for animals and for humans, um, when, we, when we see these overlapping sciences that feed into them. And so we're doing a bit of work at the moment internally here to try and unpack what that can look like and what 
how that can inform our systems and processes in how we redefine what we do in conservation and animal welfare. And it's early days for us. We've, um, we're testing a few different models and different processes, but we're convinced it's going to lead to some really exciting things and changes in, in how we do things and how we, how we learn from here. And we've integrated this into our strategy and what we're focusing on into, the, into 2030. So over the next decade, Jenny talked before about the past decade from 2009 and that transformation to a conservation organization that really focuses on what's in our own backyard. Now we're looking to what, what does the next decade look like? And we're convinced that this, um, this really holistic approach that integrates different knowledge systems within Western sciences, but also through traditional owner knowledge systems here um, and what that, can, what that can lead to in terms of emerging ways of doing things. And so our focus areas there are dedicated to within this working for wildlife hub around um, those four action areas. So that Jenny talked about earlier. So threatened species, biology, zoo animal welfare, emergency wildlife response and outreach, and also the, the community or the social science or the advocacy part for what we do and blending them together to create a holistic hub. So what we're really excited about is um, redefining what role zoos can play in this movement here locally in, in Victoria, but also in uh, more broadly in Australia and globally, we're convinced there could be similar opportunities for other zoos worldwide to take on this, this mission and this path. But um, we're really, really committed to big programs around um, sharing these stories with our visitors around ethical consumer, consumerism and ethical wildlife tourism and what the role zoos can play in particular in, in talking about what is an appropriate and respectful relationship with wildlife and how to behave in wildlife friendly ways. So we're launching a few big programs coming up in the next few months that you'll hopefully start to see around the traps um, in, this, in this space around ethical wildlife tourism and this wildlife friendly coffee. And uh, so it's led to some really exciting community-based campaigns and advocacy work that we do with locally and, um, and more broadly as well, that really is embedded in, in us motivated to, to try and have a stronger voice and do more to tackle climate change. And this is all really, um, really stemmed from um, some values that we as an organization put into practice um, about two years ago, just before the bushfires. And one in particular that really um, that really filters through this work is is being always curious. So being able to to question and unlearn things and being comfortable by having an open mind and unpacking just because we've done something before or have done for decades doesn't mean we should continue to do it over the next few decades. So this value of curious curiosity being open to new knowledge, recognizing just that slither of the pie chart there that we is what we know and what we don't even know that we don't know just yet. And this has created a lot of excitement in our staff and in the culture at Zoos Victoria in being excited about what's next and what, what could come. And just briefly on the, the psychology behind a lot of this, it's, um, it's pretty challenging, a lot of the, the images and the work, but what we try and do and what we see our role as in supporting the community through this is through this message of hope. So yes, you can see de devastating Im images of wildlife impacted, but when we talk about what we can do and how we can support each other and wildlife through this, it makes a, a really positive framing for us. And there is a fair bit of science that's published. We're just putting up a few papers on the screen here that really highlights around this, this empathy-driven um, ethical altruism. And Jenny mentioned this before without where we saw in our market research data that the community do really get behind this and care about this work. And it, may, it makes them have a more positive sentiment of zoos and what we do as well. And this is all triggered by this concept of, of empathy. So humans is very social species. Um, having this as, as a, a really deep emotion that can be triggered when we talk about wildlife and hope and give people that, that lens of there is things that we can do to support wildlife and each other through these, these times. 
And that leads me to ending with another final story. This little boy, the one in the middle, his name's Isaac. He visited a zoo and learned about how few tigers were left. And in the car on the way home, his parents realized he got very quiet and they said, what's going on? And this little boy said, it's not right. We should do something. No, he's six and he knows that. And when they got back home, they came out to Werribee Open Range Zoo. He spent some time with a couple of our scientists and he's decided that he won't have birthday presents, that he'll ask people to give him money that he can donate to saving animals. And he did it for his fifth birthday, his sixth birthday, his seventh birthday. He's now about nine or 10 and he's an absolute crusader for wildlife. He is not shy to tell politicians that they should be doing something. And that's really not only good for the wildlife, it's good for us as humans. We need to do something. And so we need to help people in being able to do that something. Because after all, we only have one planet. We have this beautiful chunk of rock that we share with so many incredible creatures. And actually it's up to us to think holistically about wildlife, to think about wildlife that's doing well and wildlife that's not doing well. Whether that's in our care, whether that's in the wild or whether that's just something out there in our garden we need to help wildlife all the time. And we believe we can if we're committed to doing that. And so I'm gonna stop sharing there and maybe bring back Sarah and open up for a couple of questions and discussions. Well, thank you very much, both thank of you. That's a very inspiring talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, um, Jenny and Sally. That was... Um... Well, I think that will resonate with a lot of people. I think it's it's wonderful um, just hearing, uh, particularly about the holistic approach, but also thinking thinking about the people side of things, you know, the wildlife warriors um, and some inspiring characters. And I think just tapping into that that human desire to want to help um, in times of crisis. And I think also I think for the, those of us on this side of the world, we obviously saw in the media all, all the stories about the, the fires, but um, I, I think it just brings it home a bit more hearing from you guys firsthand just how confronting that was. Um, and I think um, if I have to share one of the great things that came out of it is our colleagues in, in, in Argentina this year had equally devastating bushfires. And unfortunately, a lot of people didn't hear about that. But they contacted us and said, what should we do? And we went, well, here's our plans. Here's what we did. And they literally picked that up as if it had been a manual and they rolled it out. And they did very much the same things we did. Um, and suddenly realized as well, just the capacity we have within zoos that when we're called on. And, and so again, whenever there's this kind of crisis, turn, look to your local zoo and ask them what they're going to do because they need to be getting involved as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fabulous, fabulous. And, and um, I mean, one of the questions that came up was thinking about the role of, of zoos, um, you know, moving forward into the future. And you, you guys have obviously talked about how you see um, Zoos Victoria in in the coming years, um, and and hopefully the, the, that could be something for other zoos. But how how do you see the role of zoos internationally in the future? Um, you've obviously talked a lot about native species um, and the impact of climate change, but you know there are still zoos out there that have that focus on um, you know the traditional species um, and bringing people through the gates. Um, and maybe place lip service to to you know all of those those issues but how do you see it I've, I've seen a lot of zoos move quite dramatically over the last decade and and you know where we're going to make the biggest impact is not on some of those big charismatics there you need space you need national parks you need governments involved but actually we're losing just as quickly we're losing insects and songbirds and um, just abundance of birds in our gardens. And, and so I'm always a little frustrated when people go, oh, it's easy for you. You've got lots of cool animals that are in trouble. Um, actually, you've all got lots of cool animals that are in trouble and we're just not thinking about it right. And in fact, we won't save birds if we don't save insects and we won't save insects if we don't save plants. And if we're all going to plant the same hom homogeneous collection of plants in our gardens and they're all hybrid infertile stuff so that's a whole rant but um actually we're encouraging others to do more and more and what we're able to show is that 
it does not distract from the mission of people coming through the gates. The more good work we do, the more people visit us. We have just tipped over 300,000 annual members. That's a lot of people paying a lot of money to, to support us. And many of them kept their memberships up to date and paid even though we were closed during COVID. One of the things that kept us afloat was the people who believe in our mission. So I don't think it's a either or, I think it's an and. You need to look after your big animals and look after them well, but we need to look after the little stuff that doesn't display well. A lot of the animals we work with are very hard to see. They're cryptic, they work, you know, they're creeping around at night. Um, but I might head over, I see Rebecca had a question, Sal, in the Q&A that might be really good for you. She's asking, how did we look at the welfare assessment used for koalas, key indicators, and how we use those indicators post-release? Yeah, good question. And we've got uh, um, this as a publication coming out soon. So um, I can make sure that Sarah and Nick and um, others can have access to the full report and information. But in summary, um, it was highly dependent on the time in care. And so obviously the, the shorter the time, the better for animals post-release survival. Um, also the time it took for them, so in the immediate aftermath, if they were rescued very quickly after the, the event and got medical care um, quickly, then their recovery was faster and they tended to do better when released into the wild. The key indicators we looked at were a range of um, health metrics around speed of recovery, um, severity of injuries, body condition scores, we also um, did a bunch of fecal sampling for stress hormones and um, they're still under analysis. So we don't have the results to talk about for that, uh, that, that part of what we did, but looking at the analysis there, we also did behavioral observations at different points in the koala's recovery. So from they moved through stages from immediate rescue to intensive care and triage units to transfer to a to a wildlife hospital at Zoos Victoria. And then they moved to a rehab center either with carers or shelters or um, with some partners at Phillip Island Nature Parks where they have these big beautiful fitness, pre-release fitness pens where the koalas could um, climb, get a sea breeze in their face again. And it's amazing how um, just, yeah, just how important features like that are for recovery of, of these incredible animals as well, getting them um, climbing strength again. The things with koalas that we were able to, because of time and care was quite extended, were able to find um, how severe some of their burn injuries, you might, you think you're fixing just the you know, the, the birds, are, the burns are quite bad, bad on their um, foot pads. But what happened was the heat that they were exposed to was so deep that it, it resulted in some bone injury internally as well, at their nail beds. And so they, they over time, over a few months, ended up losing a lot of nails. And that can be um, a, a bit of a death sentence for koalas who need to climb trees and access food. So it was um, really important that we were able to document that and um, and monitor these animals so intensively as individuals throughout this this period and um, and learn from it and then put that into practice. So what we're doing at the moment is writing a lot of those learnings, working with other um, wildlife agencies in the state, writing them into the the response plan for what to do with koalas impacted by bushfires. So the more research, you know, I know this is one issue that koalas face, one species here, but the more that we all can contribute to those kind of learnings when we have these opportunities to study these individuals, um, the better our practice is going to be that's, that's all animal animal centred. So um, some think, yeah, interesting learnings. So one of the other things we learned is there's always a rush to get animals back in the wild after an extreme event like this, but it's often very difficult because the environment recovers very slowly. And so while the animal seems to have recovered, your environment may not. And we learned with the koalas, they don't always take good decisions. Um, one of them headed straight into a logging coop. So we had to watch him every day and make sure they didn't cut down the trees nearest to him. Uh, one headed straight into a burn area where there was no viable food. So they, of course, don't know that the rest of the environment is, is destroyed. And so that, I think, in all future events, 
has put a lot greater burden on us and, and a lot of greater confidence to argue back with authorities who are going, release them, release them quickly and release them there. We now know that may not be in the best interest of the individuals. Um, Rebecca has another question there just about the welfare assessments. Um, did any of the welfare assessments lead to euthanasia rather than release? Yes, good question, Rebecca. Um, it was, yes, very, very high euthanasia rate for, um, for a lot of these animals. It's um, an incredibly um, traumatic and serious event that they went through. So um, we actually... Um, Again, we've just published a, a similar paper outlining. We actually applied the five domains model to this situation and characterised the different welfare issues that can um, arise from such an event. And again, I can circulate that publication to you guys. But um, we, in that, we we looked at the survival rate through the different stages of rescue. Um, rehab release and at every point you need to have a, a filter that you check through whether euthanasia and and be comfortable that sometimes that is the even if you put 10 months into an animal in rehab um, sometimes that is the best decision for that animal obviously the the sooner the better but um, I think it was ultimately less than 10 percent would make it through to release um, so it, yeah, a very high euthanasia rate, but from a, when you think of it from a purely welfare-based um, perspective, that's actually a positive welfare outcome compared to um, the more prolonged suffering that you would expect for some of those individuals if they weren't, um, if the yeah, suffering wasn't put to an end sooner. So um, euthanasia is a key, a key part of this, this piece of work. And I, I think it's worth sharing that this is not like your normal world. This is a really intense, we put staff right into the middle of a, a live fire zone. Um, the animals that are being brought out are often in very poor condition and needing a lot of help. And, and our staff were incredible, but it was really taxing on them and their, their own psyche and well-being. We're not we're not trained for that. We we kind of skip happily through the world trying to save everything that we go along with. And, and that's just not the world we found ourselves in. And so while I'm saying that I think others should take this on, we should take it on with really wide open eyes that it's difficult and that you do spend a lot more time euthanizing animals than you spend um, uh, then you spend saving them. And, and thanks, Jessica, you've just said, you know, uh, we have a reputation for caring for our people. How did we care for the staff? And maybe Sal, you want to talk about that? We, we um, actually hired someone who's been helping our staff deal with compassion fatigue. Um, Anastasia, she's great. She uh, makes us meditate and do all kinds of things but actually was incredibly useful. We rolled that through to dealing with COVID and being in lockdown. And, and she's done some incredible webinars for us as well, where just helping all of us deal with some of the, the, the kind of issues that we were dealing with, but particularly for staff on the front line. So you had a, a closer relationship with them. Yeah, Jess, great, great question. It's um, it's such a critical, but I think under understudied and under recognised topic for us who work in this this field to be um, really transparent about. And I wish now, you know, I've just been banging on about um, how important it is to research and document these things and gain learnings from it and put it into practice. My biggest regret is not setting up some detailed research from the human psychology perspective in tracking that and being able to um, more formally document what happens. We absolutely have great reflections and learnings that were collected anecdotally through trial and error processes and things we put in place. But um, boy, oh boy, looking back, it would have been a fascinating um, big chunk of research, but um, it's, it's not too late. We can still learn a lot from it, but there was, there was a lot on the ground. I think my personal reflections working with the teams is the importance of having those debrief sessions with a professional, so a compassion fatigue professional um, who is trained specifically to help animal caretakers through these kind of traumas and, and doing it um, like proactively, so scheduling them in for the teams working 
um, and group sessions and individual sessions to, to tailor people's uh, individuals' preferences for it and having them just locked in and scheduled. The other thing we found useful was the um, being part of a team. And, and so the burden wasn't on individuals. It was absolutely a team effort and everyone was um, in it together. And so it wasn't, you know, anyone's individual responsibility or accountability. It was really seen as, as, a, as a team effort and that sense of sharing, sharing the burden was um, quite important, I think. Um, last reflection on that one would be, um, and we talked about this in the, in the slides previously, the importance of hope and having something that was good that was going to come out of this and that motivation that we could even, you know, establishing the research groups and the, the working groups and the knowledge and learning and, and, and having those, those moments where we felt like we could do something better and something good was going to come out of this and regularly you know so, so initiating kind of proactive future focused programs even in the middle of when we're still dealing with the emergency so the fires are still burning we were just starting to set up future focused learning research there that was a really important I think strategic approach there but also having moments where we could each share stories of hope together I remember one um, with the threatened species team, the um, the Carabri frogs were um, the couple of species, northern and southern Carabri frogs up at Mount Kosciuszko in New South Wales that um, have been absolutely decimated through chytrid fungus. And there's these incredible explosions that you know we just started to see the species um, take take a positive turn, and the trends were starting to change because of them being in these. Um, these what we call exclosures that are field-based enclosures up at Mount Kosciuszko in, in situ. And, um, and we saw the fire burn straight through where those, those frogs were in those, those exclosures. And um, re had researchers, partners up in New South Wales, um, after the fire had burnt through, go up there and just see, um, you know, the, the tin completely melted and um, complete blackness. And then... Um, filmed as he was up there, Dave Hunter, and um, doing what they do to, to, to survey frogs is, but, well, for crabby frogs, you pretty much just make any noise and they call back um, to call for them. And with this, you know, visuals of devastation around him, he wasn't expecting any return calls, but he, he called for them and, he, and a few individuals started to call back. And, um, and individuals had survived such an intense fire and they started to come out of... Um, of these wet, you know, refuges that they'd found in there, and uh, and he had it on on film. The call, the call back, the first call back, and you could hear the emotion in in him when he realised there were survivors, and and um, and as the frogs started to emerge, and um, just that that footage and the sharing of that was just. Um, with the team was in incredibly special so we had we had moments like that where it just you know you, you needed that to keep going and then the moments you know we, we found we found um uh I came across a puddle of of tadpoles and the species we thought potentially had gone extinct so the giant burrowing frog and these researchers came across one by accident this this puddle of tadpoles and managed to collect them and now they're safe and secure in a specially designed frog bunker back at Melbourne Zoo which is you know going to be the future of that species and um, yes yeah, stories of survival from from wildlife from animals from people and um, and the hope for the future. So having that lens of, um, of hope and of our, our ability to take action to, to do more and um, alongside the structured psychological support for the team and the, and the, yeah, the team efforts was, that was a long-winded version of that, but um, <laughs> yeah, the, the learnings and um, yeah, wish, wish we'd documented it more formally, but um, we will um, continue to investigate that as a, as a research area as well. And I, I'm going to add a little bit. That the, the outpouring of love from the community made a huge difference. They drew pictures. They said cards. You, you know, the vets would get this, dear vet, thank you for being a nice person letter. 
And, and you, you don't know how much that means until you open one or a check that has $250,000 check in it. That's always better as well. But um, just the sense we weren't alone, the messages of support from around the world. And we will always do that now when we see someone struggling through an emergency somewhere else because of how much it meant to us when people just reached out and said, hey, we know you're doing it tough, but we're thinking about you. And, and that sounds so trivial, but it's not when you're in that moment. Um, it really made a difference. What it's also enabled us to do in Sally Talks of Hope is that picture she put up where we went, okay, we had an emergency and we didn't have what we needed to fight it properly. Now, the next time we will. And that's been an incredible coming together with people like the RSPCA, Animals Australia, WWF, everyone saying, how do we build better wildlife hospitals that don't just service the zoo, they service the wider um, wildlife world? How do we have the right equipment? How do we train enough dog and cat vets that when we need help with koalas, they're able to help? And so our vision is really to be in the middle, but not alone. And so that when we need to call on vets, we can help them, equip them. There were some incredible um, GP vets that literally came in for two days training and then were deployed next to one of our vets because we couldn't do it on our own. The, the kind of amount of work we were trying to do we just needed help from everywhere. And so we will be stronger next time. We will be ready next time. Sorry, Sal, there's some really technical questions for you um, in the Q&A. So I'm gonna hand back to you to handle the, the technical ones around um, whether animals stayed on and as well as factors that, that lead you to decide on euthanasia. Yeah, really, really good question about non-releasable, non but um, potentially could still live a good life in a, in a zoo facility or a captive facility. Um, this was a really interesting point of discussion. There were a few koalas that um, were in this category. So those ones I mentioned before, those, um, those injuries where the, the nail, so the, the heat from the toe pads being burnt and, and that thermal exposure really... Um, impacted the bone and nail nails weren't ever going to grow back but um if it lives if it, that individual can live in a zoo with where there's plenty of food provided and the need to to climb huge eucalypts is less um survival critical then potentially could live a good life so we went through this process of going well what you know, what do we deem, um, like what, what individuals would we say are suitable? Because the, the vets and the carers and the researchers um, working directly with these individuals were anecdotally saying, oh, this, this animal is quite comfortable in care. This animal needs to be released straight away. And um, so they were picking up on these nuances and we didn't actually have any formal tool to help inform that decision-making. So we tried to get some behavioural OBS done on those individuals to have something to inform that kind of assessment and some, some demeanour and nature based through, through QBA, so quality of behavioural um, assessment methodology um, to try and learn better um, what we can do. So do better with those, those science, more science-based decision-making around that. And um, we do have one... Oh, sorry, I've got dog bark in the background we do have one koala roger that is still um actually two but vicky's come back in once and might go back uh back for release again she came in with a, a non-bushfire related injury um and so we do have a couple of koalas in that situation and i will say it's also not just a one point of decision making there but we often review again in three months we say right we think this animal might um, be able to live a good life with us still um, but let's assess again let's give it a go for three months and put in place some really clear metrics and indices around behavior and um, and welfare and then reassess in three months and then again in 12 months and be comfortable um, making that decision with as much evidence as we have but yeah really and really so important it's, discussion. it's fair to say that we tried to get them out so all of them did get re-released. Some of them didn't make it back in the wild. And so what made them more appropriate for care with us was, you know, you put them out and, and three months later, they're in a terrible condition and, and making fairly bad choices. Yeah, and um, sorry, just the other one from Bruce, I can see there. 
um, any welfare factors that usually lead to euthanasia that were not initially considered. Um, yes, very species specific, that one. Again, mm -hmm. like the, the nails and the koalas are quite um, specific issue to that species, but um, across the other range of species as well, quite a few of those factors that, um, yeah, that, that we picked up on and are now reviewing and, and trying to write into codes of practice for what we can do into the future. But um, yes, it's almost one of those, like that pie chart in the slides we had, what we know is, is that slither of the pie. And after going through that experience and starting to document that little slither of the pie, we've now got um, a whole other chunk of the pie that we didn't even know that we didn't know. So um, the more, yeah, the, the more of this work that we do. And, and I should say, um, that's been a key action out the back of this to invest strategically more in this science-based wildlife rehabilitation field. So we've got a new specialist role in the team as a new discipline of science called wildlife health and welfare specialists to, um, to do just this, to establish more, um, more of an evidence base behind our decision-making in this wildlife care and rehab work. And, and I think so, what, one other is just how we can be more proactive. Picking animals up after a heat event or an emergency event is the worst possible way to be treating them. And so we've got really involved in things like flying foxes that can't tolerate repeated days of really high temperature and working there with carer network with the parks on what we can do ahead of those days, getting sprinkler systems installed. Um, we know where they're going to get into trouble from the animals that we have to pick up and deal with after a situation. And so the more we can be proactive, the better. Um, we were also involved through the fires in an extraction of a, a population of really endangered birds ahead of the fire front, um, held them for about a month and a half and then put them back in the wild. We need to be ready to do that. And, and that's just the kind of crazy thinking that we don't get into until you've been through trying to patch up animals after a fire. You start thinking about who you can extract ahead of the fire like we do with people now. All right, we could do this for hours and hours, guys. But um, go ahead, back to you two. Thank you so much, Jenny and Sally. Honestly, it's been really, really quite um, inspiring and I think it will resonate with a lot of people um, just thinking about all the, the things you've learned as, as a product of the awful situation you found yourselves in but just how um, others can learn from that um, and, and sadly the reality is that more and more people um, will be facing similar similar events and and how we tackle it is, is so important and also just talking about how important the research is and um, and making decisions that evidence-based as well is, is so is so valuable but yeah we are out of time um yeah I'll, I'll, I want to talk to you both for the next three hours actually but <laughs> um, but we're really grateful to you both from wild welfare and global animal welfare for sharing sharing your time and and your information with us and I'm sure I'm sure there'll be more questions when people um watch the recording as well we could talk for another three hours too, Nick, but we, yeah, we better, we better call it there. But yeah, it's been great fun and um, always happy to, to talk about this stuff. So yeah, feel free to reach out if there's any further questions. Well, thank you very much again, guys. Um, it's been very inspiring, as, uh, as Nick has said, and uh, I'm sure that everyone who's attended or will uh, go on to watch uh, the recordings definitely come away with uh, lots to think about. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening there. Thanks so much. Thank you.